So, um, there's been quite a lot of talk about digital twin, twins already today, and uh, I want to give a case study to you um, about the Trinity Business School, which has only opened very recently, but I, I want to do that in a slightly different context, if I may. Uh, I want to approach it from the point of view of the asset owner, Trinity College Dublin. So rather than looking at it from a, a design viewpoint or a, a contractor's uh, viewpoint, uh, I want to look at it as an asset owner's viewpoint as to what Trinity College was trying to do and how, uh, through the help of the Invicara platform, we were able to uh, um, execute the project uh, through to operation. So Trinity has about one and a half million euros worth of uh, construction work on its books at the moment. Um, the business school just opened, uh, Printing House Square is already uh, um, two thirds finished, Learning Foundry is completing design, and the other three projects there are all at various stages of uh, appointment of uh, architects and uh, trying to decide what the Trinity actually wants, what the client actually wants. And uh, I want to focus particularly on the Trinity Business School because um, each one of those six will all be using at least level two. Indeed, the latter ones may be very well using level three BIM. So uh, we have a little bit of experience of using uh, level two BIM and that's a learning experience. But because we're approaching it from the point of view of an asset owner, uh, um, there's a slightly different emphasis. So this is a six-story uh, building. Um, it uh, cost about 80 million euro and um, about 14,000 square meters. And uh, the day it opened, or the day after it opened, there were literally hundreds of students, academic staff, uh, catering staff, facilities management in the building for the first time. And it had to work. It's a naturally ventilated building. So uh, uh, all the various systems, um, the um, the, the building management system had to work, uh, the BIM model had to have predicted things uh, correctly. So I'm indebted to uh, David Cahill and uh, David Walsh for allowing me to use uh, these particular slides, but you can see the profile of the building, which was developed into a full uh, three-dimensional BIM model, as you can imagine. Um, and um, in addition to that, the Mech and Elec have been um, Taken, have taken forward the um, post-occupancy assessment of the building as well. So we have them looking on a daily basis uh, for at least one year, and then we'll see what the data is telling us after one year. Uh, we've heard a lot about a digital twin, and you know digital twins have been around for a long time. I thought about both of these, uh, because there was great clarity this morning on what a digital twin actually is. So I probably shouldn't need to ask you this question, but I was going to, is that are both of these digital twins? This is a concrete plant, in which information is coming in to the batcher man uh, who makes decisions about what's going to go into a concrete mix before the concrete leaves. So is that a digital twin? On the other hand, on the right hand side, we have a very uh, closely mimicked replica of the, uh, not only the uh, apparatus, namely the, the, the airplane itself, but also the environment in which it works, in which pilots can train and react to new circumstances, new equipment, uh, etc., and so on. So are both of those digital twins, and strictly speaking, only one of them is. Uh, I don't know if you have a view on which one is, but it's the one on the left. And that's because there is live data being fed in. So yes, it is as built, and if it changes, you change the model. It's a digital model. Uh, yes, there is live information coming in, and based on that live information, you make decisions, uh, which will affect, in this case, a particular product. The one on the right uh, doesn't actually feed, feed live data in from an airplane and then change what happens, although it very closely replicates what does happen in a real air airplane. So strictly speaking, the letter of the law, the left one is and the right one isn't. But it does give us an insight into what is needed. So I'm not going to go through these definitions, they're, they're in the paper. But the point is that we have what has happened on site. And that's not good enough for two reasons. First of all, um, we have to be sure that as the work progresses through design and through construction, as was said this morning, we have to be absolutely sure that the data is up to date when it gets handed over. So that isn't something that happens a week or a month beforehand, that happens on day one. And it takes a lot of work to keep these things up to date. Um, so that, that's one of the features uh, of a, uh, a BIM model or a digital twin which, which comes forward. The other thing, of course, is that we have to have some live feedback. So something has to be telling us as to what's going on so that it may be current now, but we need to be able to predict what's happening in the future. So for example, we have put our own sensors in this building with permission, which supplements the, uh, uh, the management system, which tells us that if you've got uh, 
80 people sitting in a room for 80 people for four hours, does the ventilation system kick in? Are the CO2 levels getting high, are the temperatures getting high, concentrations drop, uh, and, and therefore one isn't successful in a teaching environment? So these are important things that we must keep a check of as we proceed uh, with the digital twin. So these were things that Trinity was looking for when they spoke at an early stage to designers. And you, you might think that uh, ECI stands for early contractor involvement. In my world, ECI stands for early client involvement so that the client was actually specifying very closely. Um, I'm not going to go through these things again. They were discussed as part of a static model. These are things that would go in, and we had to have all of these things as well, except to keep them up to date with what was happening. But what we're particularly interested in is the in-use stage. So how do we go effectively from a static BIM model to an asset information model to a digital twin? That was what we were hoping to achieve, and indeed, achieve this. Somebody else was talking about this, of developing things over uh, campus-wide. We hope that if this is successful, that all of these uh, construction projects over the next 15 years or so will all, at least, at the very least, incorporate what I've just described. Um, so what we expect in a, in a, in a dynamic digital twin is a, a lot more than a, a static one, and that has, is what has been delivered. So we know from the first two months of experience of this building is that uh, through the help of the platform, which is going to be described uh, um, in a few moments by Louise, is that we've been able, uh, or at least Trinity has been able to uh, uh, effectively run the building from day one using the, uh, um, using the BIM model for sure, but using the management system as well, uh, together with the additional sensors to see exactly what's going on and to make the necessary adjustments. So at this point, I'm going to hand over uh, to, to how was that achieved. Thanks, Roger. Um, okay, so I'm going to go through the process from the Invicara point of view and how, how we delivered on what Trinity were asking us to assist them with. So 3D models and digital and BIM authoring tools are the seed or the foundation from which the digital twin evolves. It's the seed of how the, the asset information evolves. So to do that, we have to aggregate the asset information. So we do this in four stages. So the design stage is actually broken down into two separate stages. So for the design data, initially we ask the design teams to classify and to give certain parameters within the model, generally caption the what and the where. Um, once we have that complete, we try to track the, we, or we ask them to, to give us the design performance data. So for very specific assets, so the assets that Trinity <coughs> would have told us that was going to be important to them, what are they going to want to monitor, we would have, we would have um, requested specific performance data and that just was to allow us to monitor that, that data going forward. So one of the very particular parts of the design data we ask for is Uniclass. So Uniclass is significantly important when it comes to machine learning and using models outside of the BIM process. It takes away the risk of human error. It's, so I might call something a toilet, you might call it a WC. How does a machine understand that they're actually the same thing? So it takes away the, the human risk by, it has a very specific product code and that's what we expect to see. That allows us to, when we're running our checks, that we can say we're looking for this uniclass code and this is what we're looking for attributed <coughs> to that uniclass code. So it takes away the, um, the ambigu ambiguity that can come from language differentials. So the next phase then, we're looking for construction specification data. So this would be from generally from your technical submittals. Um, and we're looking for very specific data within those technical submittals because it's not going to, to be very efficient if Trinity have to go and dig out this information from a product data sheet. If we can get the key data from those data sheets and have them input into the system, then that, that data is readily accessible and can be, can be accessed on the platform very easily by the by the maintenance or operations team as required. And then again the commissioning data, serial numbers, commissioning 
dates. So when did the warranty start? The warranty start dates. Um, particular warranty information, etc. Test certificates. What What's important for Trinity to to actually be able to to maintain this building in the long term because these assets have a have quite a long life cycle. So that's how we get involved with the early BIM stage. Then we, all of this is feeding into our asset information model. So that's the op model for the operational phase. So to produce that, we work with the client to define their strategy and goals and their information requirements. So like I said, we've, we've sat with them at stage one and sat down and agreed that these are the particular assets that need to be tracked. This is how how we, how how the client wants to use that data and how can we best help them deliver on it. We collect that data, be it from the models and from non-model based workflows. That then is all integrated on the Invicara platform in the asset information model, which then goes on to become the digital twin. So how do we get it from an asset information model to a digital twin? So our asset information model feels in, feeds into our digital twin platform, and then we pull in information. We pull in maintenance information, space management, IoT, so the, the sensors that Roger spoke about earlier on, we're pulling in that, all that information into the platform to give a picture of what's going on at, at the, in the building at any particular point, and inspection and maintenance data. So in conclusion, the key parts of, or the key, the key things that we need to deliver a digital twin, so uh, an information management strategy, how are we going to deliver what the client wants at the end of the day, how are we going to check that, and how are we going to ensure that the client gets a usable system. A flexible and extensible platform such as the Invicara platform, so this can be tied to the, the BMS system that, that Trinity College are using, it can be tied to the building sensors that are be, have been installed and um, Trinity have a campus wide document management system and it's all tied, <coughs> tied together. So that obviously flows into the connected systems. And I've through that. So <laughs> Thanks very much. Sorry.